and welcome to this Missouri Department of Mental Health e-learning training program on grief. My name is Tom Pancella with the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. Thank you for taking the time to take this program. We are joined by Dr. Clay Anderson, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine and is the Director of the Missouri Palliative Care Program. He also has a faculty appointment in the MU Center for Health Ethics as a clinical ethicist and in the Sinclair School of Nursing as a teacher and research collaborator and as a part-time senior medical director for Hospice Compassus Incorporated Central Missouri office. He is board certified in palliative care, medical oncology, and internal medicine, and leads his team in caring for people and families living with life-limiting illness of many kinds. He teaches and generates original work for the MU School of Medicine, University of Missouri Healthcare, and beyond in the areas of end of life, hospice and palliative care, pain management, palliative supportive oncology, patient physician communication, narrative medicine, and spirituality in healthcare. His education includes his undergraduate degree from MU and an MD degree from Stanford University and postgraduate training from the University of Colorado in Denver and the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Anderson, thanks for being with us today. Good to be here, Tom. I always like to start these things with a little bit of background and definition. So could we kind of go over the important concepts uh, related to grief? Grief is a thing we don't often think about in our everyday living, particularly in the modern culture where uh, dying is oftentimes separated from us in the terms of occurring in hospitals and um, you know, us really being surprised when uh, we lose a loved one oftentimes. Um, and so I think those concepts are sort of things that aren't uh, really at people's uh, fingertips most of the time. I, I think so as we bring them up, I think that they're going to, you know, um, not necessarily ring exceptionally familiar with, with all the audience necessarily. But I think um, the important things are um, grief is a journey, meaning um, uh, grief starting before a person dies. And of course, there are other kinds of grief about loss of uh, employment, loss of friends, uh, loss of opportunities. And th that's a different kind of grief, and we're not going to really focus on that gr type of grief today unless you ask me those kinds of questions. Um, but, but similar to those kinds of grief, the, the fact of grief starting before that anticipated loss occurs, continuing through the loss and extending for the rest of the person's life beyond that loss. So it, it does have a start, although the start can be a little bit um, hazy before the loss event, because usually the loss event is somewhat anticipated, and it really not having an end. I think another uh, important concept is uh, grief uh, of the death of a loved one um, being an entirely unique personal experience. That is, you, you can write lots of books and, and uh, programs and literature about it, and yet the way it, that journey is lived by a specific individual cannot be covered by any source of information. Um, and I think that um, uh, the other thing about grief is there, there's really no such thing as abnormal grief uh, because it's so unique. And there's also no such thing as completely normal grief because if you try to define normalcy by a set of parameters, people that had um, healthy grief, let's say, which you could perhaps come up with some criteria for that, that would be imperfect but but somewhat usable um, uh, it would it would be very different in different people um, there is I think uh, an important concept of um, uh, complicated grief versus uncomplicated grief I don't want to use the term healthy versus unhealthy grief because it sort of implies there's something wrong with the person if they have unhealthy grief but uncomplicated grief is typically grief that allows a person to go through that journey and within a period of months to maybe a year or two to get back to a place where they can say, I'm still sad, I still miss the person terribly, I still wish they weren't gone, but I'm looking forward to today, to next month, and to the rest of my life, and I'm trying to live my life in a way that that person who's gone would uh, be pleased with. 
and uh, that, that again that that point where you're okay again um, there's there's no single point in time for a given individual complicated grief on the other hand is a point where typically you think it, perhaps it's longer perhaps the grief journey that period of struggling intense struggling is longer but more importantly it's more intense and it's accompanied by uh, emotions and physical symptoms that suggest that that person's having an extremely difficult time getting by day to day. And we can talk more about those things, but typically in the setting of complicated grief, we think that that person may benefit from more professional assistance and support than, you know, someone having uncomplicated grief where what a hospice could provide or what family could provide may be perfectly well and adequate to support them through their journey. Well, let's get into this a little bit. You, you've referenced a couple of times the grieving journey, uh, this being a journey, and you've also talked about it, that it begins before the, an actual event sometimes. Uh, can you describe the, the journey to us a little bit? Well, again, has a beginning, has a middle, and probably doesn't have an end. Um, the beginning is often in the setting of illness, um, human illness, life-limiting life chronic illness, where uh, the patient is still alive, perhaps still um, conscious and interactive, but the elephant in the room is discovered, that is that the person is dying and is going to die, um, and has already suffered some of their own losses. In fact, that patient is already on their grief journey, probably. And now it's time for the family to really join into that grief journey, both joining the grief journey of the loved one who's going to die, but more importantly, starting their own grief journey, which will go on after the person whose grief journey, their journey they're joining is ended by their death. Of course, we don't know what happens to people's death journeys after they die, their grief journey after they die. They're probably not gone, but we, we can't really experience them. Um, so that's sort of the beginning. When the elephant in the room is discovered, the person's dying, the person goes from saying, you're going to get better, you're going to get better, you're going to get better, to you're getting worse, you're going to get worse eventually, I'm going to lose you, I don't want to lose you, I'm very sad. And my experience is to the extent that those issues can be on the table and dealt with, the healing part of the grief journey also can start before the person has died. That is, the sooner the losses are sort of uh, processed and in all kinds of ways that might look pretty difficult to the outside observer, there's healing that's already also occurring. Then comes the actual loss, that is the death of the person. And frequently that is a time when people who've been struggling, crying, whatever, uh, expressing a lot of emotion, go into survival mode. And they go into survival mode because our society, and this is an old tradition, not a new tradition, like some of the aspects of, of grief and how our society deals with it, um, has in a sense prepackaged the um, uh, events and processes that need to occur when a person does, dies. We even have terms for this, disposal of the body, uh, what are the, quote, arrangements, um, uh, you, you talked about organ donation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the wake, the visitation, the funeral, the burial. Uh, there's a whole vocabulary around that time, and typically there's lots of people around, both professional and um, uh, intimate uh, human beings with the, the family that suffered a loss, and um, they support that person. Typically, you'll get a few days off of work again a somewhat standardized package. It's shorter than it used to be in the United States. Some companies, two days, some four days, some zero days. Um, and, and that's probably, although it's the time when people think of is the worst, it's probably actually the easiest time on the grief journey because it's short, because all it has to do is be survived. There's plenty of help, and then it's over. And then there's probably really two phases after that. So there's a phase beforehand, there's the very short uh, get the stuff done phase, and then there's really two longer phases. One of them is really the crisis, 
And then one of them is, the last one is recovery, and the recovery is never over, I don't think, Unle until that person dies, actually, at 99 or whatever. Um, and we'll probably spend most of our time talking about the crisis, and the crisis is after everybody goes home, and the funeral's over, and um, the food's been put away, but most of the other stuff has not yet been put away. And it lasts until... Um, well, it's a, it's a very blurry zone, but it lasts until either the person themselves or the people around them sort of feels like they're functioning again for the most part. And grief is not over at that point. Um, that's just a, an inflection point from crisis to recovery, and the recovery is another phase unto itself. So that's um, the best way I can sort of structure that, you know, and, and, and th those sorts of concepts are in most of the literature and, of course, in Europe and in the United States and with, you know, group A versus group B, hospice versus uh, the um, religious, more religious groups through churches and so forth have different ways of conceptualizing that, but I think that's sort of a common denominator way of conceptualizing it. You touched on this already, but um, is there such a thing as normal grief? I certainly um, can't describe it, so I don't think it's a useful concept. Um, you know, a lot of times when people might have what 62% of the population would describe as normal grief, other observers are looking in on that person and what they're going through and saying, that person isn't grieving enough. So who, who, whose perspective is it that's going to call it normal or not? That's another problem. Not only, well, is it, is it a useful concept, but whose concept is it? Now, you've started talking a little bit about um, complicated grief here, and I think that that's probably where, like you said, where we'll spend some time. Um, what, how would you kind of define something then that's complicated? If everything is abnormal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, what, what then becomes complicated, and what are some of those warning signs? Well, at one extreme is the person who dies from suicide or something else because they're grieving the loss of a loved one. That's certainly complicated grief, not what we hope and expect for anyone. Um, most of what we see is certainly, obviously, much less uh, uh, exaggerated than that. But it's where struggling is so severe that it shows itself um, to people probably outside of um, the intimate circle of that person who's grieving, meaning outside their family, outside their best friends, outside their trusted colleagues at work. Um, so, so that's sort of one characteristic of it is who's aware. I think uh, another important part of it is, is um, uncomplicated grief has emotions and um, has... Um, sort of events along the way, and those emotions and events become much more exaggerated in the setting of complicated grief. Um, an example would be uh, denial, um, which is sort of an emotion, and denial in, in complicated grief would include um, not just perhaps hearing the voice or sensing the presence of a person, but insisting upon the fact that they're not really dead. For instance, say that they died in a hospital and the body was disposed of before the loved one could actually see it because they were from out of town or whatever. The, the persistent belief, despite the fact that a funeral has occurred and that there was a, you know, and sometimes maybe that was an idea for having open casket ceremony so that people could actually, yeah, that is my loved one that's in that coffin. Um, believing that the person isn't really dead. So that's denial taken to an extreme of maladaptive coping um, or no coping at all. Another example would be in the uh, emotional realm, um, actual psychiatric disorders that occur in a person who may be minimally predisposed to those psychiatric disorders, such as not just an adjustment disorder by the DSM-3 or 4 criteria, which essentially everybody has in the crisis phase of uncomplicated grief, 
in the crisis phase of complicated grief actually meeting DSM-3 or 4 criteria for major anxiety disorder, panic disorder, or the most common would be major depressive episode where there may be both vegetative and um, uh, cognitive and emotional uh, criteria being met for major depression. Major depression that's going to require both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatments if it's recognized and uh, presented to the mental health field. Um, I think that time is probably not a good criteria for complicated versus uncomplicated grief, but if a person would either self-define themselves as still in the crisis phase or be defined by an objective outside source as being in the crisis zone five years later, then that's probably uncomplic or complicated grief, where typically the crisis phase usually doesn't last longer than a year, two years at the outset, and then the recovery should start again. The person is not the same person they were before their loved one died. Um, and another form of complicated grief would be if the person that died was a gerbil and it's still having, you know, we grieve our pet's losses as well, but if it's not a homo sapiens, particularly if it's a, you know, a reptile or a lower mammal and it's two years later and the person is still can't work, can't think, um, can't concentrate, you know, that's sort of, I think, what we would call outside the, the zone of, of, of uncomplicated grieving. Substance abuse is also, and not just substance abuse, but addictive behaviors of all sorts, including, um, you know, you might think of a person who had a tendency to gamble. They're, they're, that's going to be something they can do. Typically, though, we're talking about alcohol and drug abuse. And oftentimes, it's prescription drug abuse as opposed to someone who may, in other settings, uh, uh, overuse, misabuse, or abuse um, illicit drugs. Oftentimes they have access to uh, prescribed drugs and are using them in appropriate ways early on and uh, can come to be using them for uh, maladaptive and unprescribed reasons uh, later on. And um, interestingly, we really consider um, uh, numbing normal, so-called so normal numbing um, behaviors to potentially be a part of uncomplicated grief, so-called normal grieving, meaning typically it wakes in funerals in most uh, uh, cultural settings, although not all. Um, uh, fermented beverages are allowed and in fact encouraged and, you know, they are disinhibiting for people that don't usually cry and they're allowed to cry and they're, they're, they're given some permission and alcohol is really a form of societal permission to express those feelings. I, I'm not sure I could uh, um, really comment usefully on other substances uh, uh, that you know, other cultures have, but certainly other cultures in other places have come up with other substances hallucinogenic or psychoactive substances, not just alcohol. Um, and so the, the fact of a person drinking more than usual for a period of days to weeks is not necessarily a sign of complicated grief. Um, but when those, say, alcohol ingesting behaviors start to impact after the person's supposed to be back at work and supposed to be back coaching their kid's team or making their kid's breakfast in the morning and that alcohol use is causing personal, legal, or medical problems for that grieving person, that clearly meets criteria for complicated grief. So it isn't something that you can pin down with certainty, but I think most of the time, both people on that inner circle of that person and people from the outside will know it when they see it. And just as important a question of is it or is it not complicated grief is, what to do about it. Let's talk a little bit about the role of that inner circle that you talked about, that you've referenced a couple of times, the, the friends, the, the, the people that are closest. Um, what, what is their role? I think there's, a, there's an awful lot out there about what you do, what you don't do, what you say, what you don't say, where you show up, where you don't show up. <clears throat> what's right, what's wrong? Um, I think one important aspect of that is 
deciding whether you are or are not a um, uh, a person in that inner circle. Um, because I think one of the important parts is if that person might want you to be and you don't think you are or can't feel like you can't be or don't want to be, then there, that's going to be a setup for a potential conflict that has lasting effects. Similarly, if you want to be, you're a busybody and you just want to get into everybody's business and you go in and try to, quote, be there for a person who doesn't really want you there, it, in grief, it's not about the other person. It's about the person that's grieving. It's by its very definition a selfish, self-absorbed journey, particularly that crisis part. People tend to start volunteering, looking for new meanings in their life when they're in the recovery phase, not when they're in the crisis phase. So I think, you know, and I think people can, can err either way. But let's assume for a moment that you're the brother of the person who's grieving, the loss of their spouse, let's say. That's not really uh, uh, uncertainty about whether you'd be in there. The best friend since high school. Um, a very close work colleague that spends time with that person outside of work often. Um, you'd be surprised how many what would be considered to be close friends or close work associates simply feel like it's either not their place or they're uncomfortable or unwilling or think that it's somebody else's job to be there. Um, so that's sort of the who. Um, let's talk a little bit about the when. And I think the when is at the beginning of the journey, which is before the loss. You're, in a sense, building trust with that person that you're going to, most of the time, kind of be in the right place at the right time and either do or don't do the right things before the loss. And they will welcome you in um, when the um, um, task-oriented short phase is over and when the crisis phase starts. So that's a little bit of the when. The most important thing is the what, and that's where all the do's and don'ts come from. And I think I will talk about some of the do's and don'ts, but there is um, exceptions to the, all of the rules of the do's and don'ts that prove the rules, even though they're exceptions to the rule. That's the reality of it. So I think more important to focus on general concepts. And, and I think the main general concept is to, it, it's a reversal of the typical catchphrase, which is don't just stand there, do something. It's to put it in the grief setting, you really turn that over on its head. It's don't just do something, be there. So it's really about caring presence. And so instead of doing something, be there. Instead of saying something, listen. It's about being there and about listening. Because if you don't listen, you don't know what the person wants. And you tend, because it's an uncomfortable position for anyone to be in, even people that are drawn to grieving people like moths to a flame, they're only a little bit more comfortable than people that wouldn't go there under any circumstances because they're afraid their head would explode. Um, and that person that's drawn in and is there um, is not going to do the right thing all the time. That is, you're going you're to say things you wish you hadn't said. You're going to not say things you wish you had said. And yet what really counts is the fact that you're there instead of not there and that you're listening instead of talking. So I believe most of the don'ts have to do with things that are about you and not about the person who's grieving. Because you've grieved too. You've grieved when your dog died. You've grieved when your aunt died. You may have even lost a spouse. But what happened to you and your loved one is just qualitatively and quantitatively, by definition, different than what's happened to this person. And so you will use what happened to you to uh, find, to place yourself in an empathetic um, zone, but short of that, all of your examples, all of your stuff, all of your uh, experiences are really uh, 
not particularly relevant to this person. And so in a sense, you just need to find out where they are, what they're thinking, what they need, what they want. Um, and um, the best way to do that is to be there as opposed to not being there and to listen as opposed to talk. One of the other uh, key players along the way for a lot of people would be hospice. Um, and I guess we're all kind of comfortable with the role that hospice plays along the first part of the journey, but do they have an extended role? Um, I thought you were going to say clergy, so we'll get to that one later, but that's, that can be <laughs> we can important cover them too. too yeah. sure. um, for those 35% of the U.S. population who are served by hospice before they die, that hospice is taking care of the patient, yes, but they're also over time taking care of the family. And more and more as the patient gets sicker and less able to interact, the family actually becomes as much the patient, if not more so, than the patient un up until the time that the patient dies. And so it wouldn't make sense at all for when that patient dies for the hospice to go away. And in fact, um, I think we can have some quibbles about the way the hospice benefit was set up in 1982 and the way it's been changed since then in terms of the people, equipment, medication, services provided, and so forth. But they had a concept right off the bat, which was really stolen from the volunteer hospices in Europe and Canada and early on in the United States in the 70s, which is that we don't go away when the patient dies. And, you know, when my mom died um, in 2001, in, in uh, January, the thing that upset my father the most, and to this day upsets him the most, that as soon as we took her home from the ICU with hospice, three days at home and then she died, was that there was literally no communication with either of the two hospitals that she was at, the physicians who saw her. We had residents, uh, fellows, attending physicians who spent literally hours over time in our room talking to us about life and death, joy and, and uh, sadness, triumph and, and loss. and as soon as my mom was, went home and then when she died it was out of sight, out of mind, they were moving on to the next live patient that might get saved or need their suffering treated and they were competent professionals. But, you know, the only people that um, really had a um, caring response to my mother's death were the hospice team and, of course, you know, family and friends and so forth and people from the faith community. And um, more and more, I think hospitals, particularly those with healthy palliative care programs, are having institutional responses to death, even if it occurs outside the hospital within a short period of time. But certainly most of the ones that happen inside the hospital and ha are really ex having um, um, expectations of their professionals to have individual responses to those deaths that are, you know, in a sense, cultural, there aren't requirements, but they're sort of uh, expectations. So I think that's getting better even since 2001. But more importantly, what hospice provides, and it's actually required, uh, legally required for a hospice that takes Medicare dollars to provide care for, and most hospice patients being served are Medicare patients. So that's the reimbursement scheme for the vast majority of hospice. They're legally required to provide 13 months of bereavement from the time the uh, patient dies. And they're actually allowed to come up with their own policies and procedures around bereavement, but it typically includes immediate bereavement, um, uh, sort of uh, six month um, through the holidays, and then there's typically a year anniversary of bereavement. And that is the bereavement that's required by law for the actual patients that were enrolled on hospice and served by hospice. Um, Secondarily, they also, and I believe this is also a Medicare requirement, is that they're obliged to serve bereavement functions for the community, their catchment area, meaning for those people whose loved ones died in a car accident or in a traumatic event, a heart attack, who are grieving in some ways quite differently perhaps than the person who died of an expected chronic illness over time. They don't have the hospice resources they haven't been getting them to a point, but what happens is the hospice will typically uh, have community events several times a year, particularly before the holidays, and have uh, group sessions or single events in the community where people who are grieving can come and kind of 
uh, open up long after their work thinks it's okay to do so and their family might think, well, what's he still having trouble about? So it's sort of an objective expert third party that says, no, we know you're not done with your journey yet and you can come out and um, cry or laugh or bring pictures or share stories or bring some of those old clothes finally that you were afraid to get rid of and bring them in and we'll donate them to the Goodwill for you so that you don't have to go over there, that sort of thing. I always like to try and hook people up with uh, resources. Can, uh, are there any good resources you'd like to link people to? Well, let me just make the point that uh, many people have a faith community, uh, people and their loved ones, uh, m many families and patients who are uh, being isolated by life-limiting chronic illness may have created space. Uh, sometimes that's difficult to overcome, uh, in regards to their faith community, you know, they couldn't go to church anymore. They may be somewhat um, uh, uh, disappointed that the faith community didn't come to them in their time of need. But very often, it's a very important source of, of understanding, consolation, and, and oftentimes willingness just to talk about things that aren't that pleasant and aren't that happy and are difficult and a struggle. So that's one resource right there. And it, you know, I think that, that American citizens, American residents should feel that that's a source for them, whether that's their home faith community or not. Meaning if it's church down the road and you make a call and you go visit, that Unitarian minister might be just as good as the Catholic minister or the rabbi or the um, imam or whatever is in your home community. Um, hospice is a great resource. Remember, even if your loved one wasn't served by hospice, they're, they're obligated to provide resources for you and have events. I think the mental health field is very important, and some of it is a little on the, the informal side, meaning a, a licensed clinical social worker, a counselor, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist can do individual or group therapy that may be for um, an affective disorder when really it's about grief and vice versa. It's really, it's called uh, grief therapy when really it's to treat uh, effectively an affective disorder. Um, we in the palliative care field have a number of resources that we bring to bear that typically are connecting people to a faith community, connecting people to a hospice, connecting people to mental health professionals, but also connecting to people to resources. And just to give you Two examples, one of the things that we've been handing out for a long time, this is a series of books called Compassion Books Incorporated, uh, Burnsville, North Carolina, www.compassionbooks.com, www.compassionbooks.com. This is one of many, and this is the grief book, and it's only, I think, uh, 15 pages long. And it contains really unreferenced wisdom that's very digestible and very helpful that you can read over and over and over again that both helps your emotions but helps you sort of know whether you're the loved one, the friend, or the, the grieving journey or yourself kind of remind you uh, kind of what, what you might be wanting to focus on, including do's and don'ts. And this is 15 pages. And then there are any number of books. This is one that we've found particularly helpful uh, called Transcending Loss, Understanding the Lifelong Impact of Grief and How to Make it Meaningful. And, you know, I think uh, we in the palliative care field like to take lemons and make lemonade. And one of the things is not just um, surviving the loss of your loved one, but really finding on your grief journey for the rest of your life, finding ways not just to resiliency, that is strength and the ability to move on, but really... Um, Flourishing, that is ways that your loved one who's died would look down on you and smile because you're doing well. Um, whether you found another life partner or not, whether they wanted you to or not, whatever, those things aren't always talked about. And a book like this that really focuses on how to make the rest of your life meaningful, and I think what they mean by that is good. Um, uh, it, this is a great resource that uh, really covers all those issues of, of uh, anticipatory grief, um, the arrangements, uh, the crisis period, and, and the recovery period that can last a long time. So, so there, there's, there's any number of web and library resources, but I think you kind of go down the list of, of your family, uh, your health care providers, your clergy, your, your community, your faith community, 
and resources are helpful too because there's something you can really grab onto and mark up and write on and, and can be very helpful. Well, Dr. Anderson, thanks for your time and your expertise today.